Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our press conference today. My name is Brendan Stone, and I'm the co-chair of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. And I'm also a steering committee member of the Cross Canada Campaign to Free Meng Wanzhou. And I'm happy to welcome you to this press conference today to mark the 1000th day of the unjust incarceration of Meng Wanzhou and to introduce you to the chair of the press conference, Alan Freeman. Uh, now, Alan Freeman is the co-director with Radhika Desai of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group at the University of Manitoba and manages the news and analysis website, newcoldwar.org. Uh, Alan was an economist at the Greater London Authority between 2000 and 2011 where he held the brief for the creative industries and living wage. And he wrote The Ben Heresy, a biography of British politician, Tony Ben. And Alan is also a founding member and honorary life vice president of the UK based Association for Heterodox Economics. So without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to you, Alan. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Brendan, and welcome to this press conference. Thank you for attending. The event has been organized, as you know, by the Cross Canada Campaign to Free Mung Wanjo on the Southern day of her uh, unjust detention to draw attention to the illegitimacy of the process and call for her immediate and unconditional release. The details are in the press release, which you will have received, and Chris Black and John Philpert our two experts who have kindly agreed to attend and speak to it will respond to your detailed questions. Je souhaite la bienvenue à nos participants français et francophones. Je vous invite à poser des questions dans la langue de votre choix et nos experts choisiront la langue de leur réponse. I'll just mention a few ground rules. The main purpose of the meeting is so Chris and John can provide you with additional information. So please try to confine yourself to questions, be as brief as you can. We expect polite and respectful questions and we do reserve the right to mute or remove disruptive participants. If I indicate verbally or visually that you are using up your time, please bring your question to a close. If you have a question, please use Zoom's reaction button to raise your hand, that is to put the little yellow, my hand is raised sign in your image, which I will see. And please also remember to lower the hand once your question has been taken. I will try to take questions in the order I see them, and I will endeavor to give everyone the chance to speak, time permitting. The meeting will close at 12 p.m. Eastern time, and a video of this conference will be shared live on the Facebook page and Twitter feed of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. It's now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, who will each give a brief introduction before we move to questions. Christopher Black is a trial lawyer with over 40 years experience and 20 years experience in international criminal law at the ICTR, the ICTY, and he is on the ICC Council list. He writes for several journals on international affairs and is an executive member of the Canadian Peace Congress. John Philpott is an experienced international defense attorney before international criminal courts, including the ICC and the ICTR and in Canada. He has been active in Africa, Latin America and Europe, as well as Canada. He is frequently invited to international conferences and webinars. He is an advisor on international legal issues to governments and non-governmental organizations and a former judge at the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal. His areas of interest are extraterritoriality of national legislation, unilateral and unilateral coercive measures by which is meant sanctions and blockades. So I think I'll take Chris first and uh, over to you. Right, well, we're here today to um, recognize that Meng Wanzhou has been in, held hostage by Canada on the orders of the United States for almost a thousand days, more well, a thousand days now, based on <clears throat> charges which, in our view, were concocted as a pretext to hold her hostage, the charge being um, the, the overall charge of fraud. Uh, but if you look at the nature of the fraud charge alleged is based on uh, alleged violations of US illegal sanctions imposed on Iran 
which are illegal under international law and in fact um, in violation of the agreement that the United States made with Iran to withdraw all its sanctions in the nuclear deal they made some years ago and recently. So <clears throat> we're dealing with um, a case which is uh, concocted for political reasons to put pressure on Huawei, China and, and Iran to enforce the sanctions against Iran. And it's also uh, a blow against Canadian democracy and, and civil liberties, because if it can happen to Meng Wanzhou, it can happen to anybody. I'll leave it there. Maybe John can pick up from there. Over to John. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. I'm pleased to be here with you today. I think the primary pressing issue now is Canadian political responsibility. The Minister of Justice can stop this under Article 23, Alinea subparagraph C, today. They know now what they may not have known fully before, that HSBC met Meng Wanzhou, senior executives were fully informed of what was going on. Everybody knew, and there could not be any prejudice to HSBC, which is the foundation of this concocted charge. Now, it's up to the Minister of Justice, we're in election, to say no under Article 23. We know that this process is very negative for Canada, serious economic loss, and this extraterritorial legislation is an attack on Canadian sovereignty. She committed no crime in Canada. There's no connection to Canada. Whatever she discussed was in Hong Kong between a company in Hong Kong, HSBC, and there's no relationship to Canada. I'd like to um, stress the, the um, importance of Canada becoming a country. Our president was not Donald Trump and our president is not Joe Biden. It's up to Canada to act. We will answer, Chris and I, other detailed questions about what's happening because I'm sure you're all interested in this. Thank you very much, John. Um, if you want to start asking questions, uh, please do raise your hand at the present. I'm looking, but I see no questions. Perhaps I should have asked you to put your hands up earlier. Or perhaps you're all stunned by the presentations. I don't know. I think one way to start is we do have a video. Oh, I see somebody here um, who is just calling themselves MM. I wonder if when you speak, you could uh, identify which organization you're from and who you are. So uh, could you unmute MM, uh, Brendan? Or request to unmute. I see also a question from Arnold, so he'll be next. I think it sounds as if there is a problem with communication with MM. So what I propose to do is move to Arnold. Would you like to put your question on? Yes, I have a very simple question, suggestion. First, I'd like to congratulate all of the uh, uh, people involved in this uh, very just campaign uh, to free uh, Meng Wanzhou without any preconditions. You know, I realize it's going uh, against the mainstream media, as well as a very important section of the so-called left in Canada. So. Congratulations to everyone. I, I was impressed but when the uh, previous uh, person spoke about Section 23.3 of the uh, uh, Canadian extradition law. Now that the elections are going on, is there any way that we can, you know, there's so much being said, focus through an ad in the newspapers or challenging all of the candidates, whether they would support Section 23 three or not, in other words, to put them on a, in, a, in a situation they would, that they would have to respond to that. And perhaps we could have a sort of a, um, a breakthrough on that because it also would include uh, uh, exchanging uh, uh, Meng, uh, Meng Wanzhou <clears throat> for the two Michaels in, uh, held in, in China. What do you think? 
Okay, I'll pass that. Um, John, would you like to go first? And yes. Then... Well, I, I think the sample question would be, Mr. Candidate, if you were elected, would you invite, or, or during this campaign, <clears throat> the Minister of Justice to exercise his discretion to withdraw the charges against Meng Wanzhou, given the evidence which was revealed by a Hong Kong court, Hong Kong court showing that senior executives were fully apprised of this. You could add Meng Wanzhou, uh, Huawei sent their money through a British bank and had no knowledge it was going to go through an American bank. And section 23 has three states, at the beginning, any time and at the end. So this is the type of question that we could craft for candidates and specifically here in Montreal, Arnold, you live in Montreal, I think, um, we could go to Mr. Lametti's uh, campaign meeting. Okay, do you wanna have something to add to that, Chris? Yeah, I agree with John. And uh, we could also add that under the extradition treaty between Canada and the United States, that Canada has an obligation to Article 4 to reject politically motivated um, requests for extradition. And I think it's quite clear from all the circumstances we've seen and examined that this is a political, politically motivated uh, concoction of the charges and her arrest and being held hostage. So <clears throat> the Minister of Justice, A, should have rejected the request when they got it, and they could have done so immediately when they got the request, when they received the request from the U.S., and never sent it to the courts, but they could still step in, as John says, under Article 23 at any time to um, pull these charges and free Meng Wanzhou and, and send the request back to the United States is denied. Because I? And, and the only deceit, I must add, the only deceit um, exhibited in this whole matter is the deceit by the American Prosecution Service, which misled the prosecution and the judge by claiming that there was a PowerPoint presentation given to HSBC by Meng Wanzhou, which was misleading or deceitful. And it turns out that was not the case at all. So in fact, they were the ones guilty of deceit. And um, judges don't normally like being taken for fools and having prosecution counsel tell them things which aren't true. So I don't think that's gonna be too, too good for them, I hope. So uh, a couple of points. Um, the next speakers I'm going to take is uh, Frank Chi. Um, Janine, Sheila Foster, and then Aidan Jonah. Um, Arnold, you need to pull your hand down now to single that your, your question's been taken. Thank you. Okay, so Frank, over to you. Oh, meantime, sorry, Brendan, could you see if we can sort out why MM is not able to uh, contribute, if you could get that unmuted. Yeah. Frank, sorry. Uh, Brendan, will get you to unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Alan. I don't see Frank showing up quite yet. Uh, how is that listed? Um, Frank. Oh, here it is. F, yeah, he's, he's at the top of my screen. But on the participant list. It's got a, Am it's got I unmuted now? He's unmuted. You can speak now, Frank. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for letting me uh, participate in this press conference. I have a question for either Chris or John. Uh, What's your assessment of the legal process so far? And uh, do you think uh, that Meng's legal team has presented enough evidence for either the judge or the minister to terminate uh, this uh, extradition process? So let's, should we take um, Chris first and then John? Is that okay with you guys? Sure. So over to Chris and after that, the next one is Janine. Um, we can only go, I can only go on the, what the defense team has done for Meng Wanzhou based, based on reports from the press, because I'm not there at the hearings and I can't tell what's going on in the courtroom uh, and, the, and the atmosphere and so on, which is important. But um, <clears throat> from all the reports, it seems that the uh, defense team has done very, very well and argued all the points John and I would make. Uh, so I think they've been very effective in doing that and in revealing and hunting down evidence and revealing that uh, because as we know, under Section 380 of the Criminal Code in Canada, to establish a fraud charge, you have to have two things, deceit and loss, not a future loss, an actual loss. There is no deceit in this case that's been established, and there's no loss. Even the Americans admit that. They are only claiming a future possible loss if HSB was hauled before American courts. So um, 
I think they've done a very effective job and uh, I don't see anybody else could have done much more. So we have to wait for the judge to make a decision. John, what do you want to add to that? Well, um, in our press release, we noted that Judge Holmes was curious about the case where there's no actual harm. Many years later, a large institution, in this large institution, HSBC, many people knew what was going on. And so I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, also, the issue, I, I, I return, she may not have all the tools to throw this out. I'm not sure, I wasn't there. I've seen the webinars on this. It would seem that she has the right and the power to um, set this aside. But the Minister of Justice, I return, the Minister of Justice is required to be just and he can, you know, Justin Trudeau was talking about the rule of law, we can't intervene. I'm sorry, the rule of law allows you to intervene and you were, must intervene if the process is fraudulent and it is fraudulent, even though all the evidence is not before the judge, as we know, there was some evidence which did not get before the judge. The minister knows, the prime minister knows, and this hostage taking um, of Meng Wanzhou hurts Canada, hurts Canadian manufacturing, and must end now. Thank you, John. I'll now take Janine, and uh, I can see somebody called Michael with their hand up, who I presume is MM. So I'm going to actually take Michael after Janine. So Janine, your question. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, I first off want to say thank you to the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and the Canada-wide campaign to free Ming Wanzhou for organizing this important conference, this important press conference on the nearly 100th day of Ming Wanzhou's incarceration and kidnapping. My name is Janine Solanke. I am a member of the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper. And so my question for you today, uh, first off uh, with a bit of background, I think many people believe that the incarceration and kidnapping of Meng Wanzhou is happening in the context of the US launching a new cold war uh, against China and Russia. So my question is, why did Canada decide to participate in this cold war? And how does Canada benefit from becoming hostile towards, uh, towards China when Canada has such an important relationship, especially economic, uh, with China? Thank you. So shall we take John first and then Chris? Is that okay with you guys? Sure. Well, jokingly, I don't know how Canada could do this, shooting itself in the foot against Canadian sovereign interests. And Canada has a real interest in maintaining economic relations and becoming independent of the US dominating force, which is on the decline. So um, realistically speaking, we have very bad political leaders, whether it is conser uh, liberal, conservative. I must say the NDP has been rather narrow-minded on a lot of international issues. It's time for us and I, I, we're repeating ourselves, to become sovereign, to act in the interests of Canada. And we saw the 19 uh, former MPs and dignitaries who I think understood this for all kinds of reasons. They want the two Michaels out, but they realized it was against Canadian interests. So um, I haven't really answered your question because there is no answer, but that's my two cents. Chris, what do you think? Well, we have to look at um, more general economic uh, and financial constraints that Canada's under. I mean, since Second World War, when uh, British capital was replaced by American capital's influence in, in, in the big, in Toronto and uh, in Canada, <clears throat> and when the uh, Canadian industrialists and financiers linked themselves onto the tailcoats of the US finance and industrialists and big corporations, uh, Canada has been nothing but in my view, a vassal state really of the United States and in all its foreign policy from the Korean war on to 
its attack on Yugoslavia, which against the legal war, against Libya, against Iraq, Afghanistan, you name it. They follow and they, they use American force, uh, Canadian armed forces as more or less auxiliary forces for the United States, a can Canadian taxpayers' uh, expense to advance American interests. And again, Canada is being hit by uh, the negative effects of this arrest of Meng Wanzhou uh, for the interest of the United States. Not, it's not for the interest of Canada, but it is for the interest of certain people in Canada. And we have to understand who they are. And that's a whole other subject. I'm not sure we have time to get into. Maybe Alan can explain more himself at some other point. Thank you, Chris. And I would add to that the scandalous position that Canada has taken in relation to Venezuela. We would actually led in setting up a group who was the intention of which was to overthrow the legitimate government of Venezuela, the Lima group. Right. which is a policy in such tatters that now Lima is not actually part of the Lima group anymore. So um, the next speaker that I have is Michael, but Michael, you may want to identify yourself, your organization, as well as your full name. Uh, hello? Hi, there, I can hear you, Michael. Come hi, uh, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm just an engaged citizen and uh, watcher of the Hamilton Coalition Stop the War. Um, I thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm wondering what could happen in the case that the judge rules against extradition. Um, if Justice Holmes stays the proceedings, uh, will the Attorney General be able to request that Hmong be detained until the Attorney General has uh, had its appeal heard by the Court of Appeal? Um, wouldn't it be just wiser to you know, not pursue an appeal. All right, okay. Well, I'm gonna hand that to Chris just to say the next up I see is Aidan Joma, then Pierre Josmin and Joe Kelly. Uh, Sheila Foster did have her hand up, but has taken it down. So I presume her question has been asked by somebody else. Okay, over to you, uh, Chris. Well, if we can go, if in that example, if Judge Holmes um, rejects the request, then yes, the prosecution could appeal that decision, I suppose. Uh, as we've seen the Americans do in the case of Julian Assange in the UK, it might, might indicate their attitude for watching that case because his, their request against Assange was rejected by the, tr the hearing judge, and now they're appealing that, and that's when he's still detained. Uh, so yes, they could do that, but whether they would do it politically is another question, because that could take some years and all sorts of consequences flow from that. So it's, uh, yes, in theory, they could do that, but whether they would do that, that's a political decision, really, which indicates it is a political case. Yeah, yeah. Okay, John. Do you want to add I have nothing to add. It's a technicality question. The principle is no, they, that she can leave. There could be legal loopholes to apply to have her um, held anyway. I don't know the answer, and I think it's more of a political question. She was cleared, let her go, and I would, Canada would be in very badly seen throughout the world if they tried to make her stay another year or two during the appeal. Okay, I have Aidan and then Pierre. So Aidan, over to you, if you could unmute him, Brendan. There we go. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thank you. And of course, uh, very glad to be here at the campaign has, has honestly done terrific work uh, so far. So my question is this, uh, with the case of uh, Meng Wanzhou, now, is this an isolated case? Or is this say part of a broader pattern? And if so, would you mind going into detail on that? Um, should we have John first and then Chris? Well, um... So you're right on the right on uh, nail on that. You're hitting the nail on the head because in the Alex Sab campaign, he was arrested when he touched down in Cabo Verde because his plane couldn't get gas on the 12th of June, 2020. He was detained and, and tortured for several months, and then he got house arrest. The West African court, ECOWAS court, ordered him released and to pay to receive $200,000 in damages, which was refused. The Human Rights Commission, Committee of the UN 
asked Cabo Verde to stop the proceedings and uh, until this uh, application for torture was uh, canceled. He has not been released. The Constitutional Court had a limited number of days. It's presently before the Constitutional Court. They were supposed to rule on the, they were all, all they're outside their delays. The Constitutional Court um, was supposed to rule on the 13th of August, didn't rule. Then everybody said yesterday, this, the 24th, yesterday or Tuesday, um, they're going to rule. They haven't ruled. And Alex Saab wrote a very um, eloquent challenge to the entire process. He's a well to do man, but he is a total patriot in Venezuela, charged with fraud in a, in a, in a court in Florida. So they use every kind of machination to get their hands on him. There's also a man from North Korea who is presently detained. And if you read Elijah Magnier, I follow him. There is a French man whose na last name is added, but I could be wrong about the name because I, who was um, Lebanese, who was cleared of fraud by the highest court of appeal in France. And the US intervened and the US is, the France consented to his extradition to the US, even though he was cleared in a French court for the same crimes held against him. And um, they're right now, they're, they're, uh, they're before the Court de Cassation in, in France now. We'll see what happens. But so legal um, tactics are part of and parcel of the US attempt to um, dominate uh, countries. And of course, you, you can see what's happening in Lebanon now. We, you know, the, People are, there's no electricity, there's no oil, no fuel. That's another question. And Iran is sending fuel to Lebanon, it seems. So the answer is yes, this is a common tendency. And Chris and I have been involved in international courts where they charge every, they charge people who lose the wars and then they're in jail. There's, there's 30 men in West Africa uh, convicted for genocide in, in Rwanda, which didn't happen that way. I'm not saying it's not horrible. So using legal tactics to uh, demonize and destroy the enemy is a very modern thing because the US can't, it's harder for them to do direct wars. So the whole question of uh, sanctions, it's related to sanctions, legal process and proxy wars is the modern tendency. And I mean, these are, this is a big subject it should be studied. And if you read, look at Tim Anderson's writings, it's very, very clear the new tactics of imperial aggression, which is all we'll have to study because we're in the anti-war movement. Yeah, and let's not forget the fate of uh, Julian Assange, who is of still course. in uh, being held under atrocious circumstances, which is that the judge has actually said that the case should not be held because of the inhumane treatment he would receive in the United States of America. And still, because of an appeal by the British government against this decision, this he is still languishing in jail under uh, horrible psychological conditions and the purpose is to terrorize people who are going to do things that might endanger the interest of the United States, even though they are in the interests of humanity, such as revealing that the United States has committed war crimes. So uh, let's not forget Julian Assange. And um, Chris, Chris, over to you. And then I have a question from Pierre. Right. Um, I could just add to, I agree with everything John said, just add that there are also, I think, three more, three or four or five Russians whose names are not right before me. I wasn't expecting this question exactly this way, but um, there are three or four Russians who've also been detained by the Americans over outside Russia based on essentially trumped up charges to pressure Russia. Uh, so they've done this with other countries. Uh, they murdered General Soleimani in broad daylight. Um, <laughs> And the, uh, I was in, in, in talking about the ad hoc war crimes tribunal set up by the UN, the ICTY, CR, Sierra Leone. It's quite clear with all the defense lawyers involved that most of those charges were fabricated based on political grounds to, to make the enemy no longer a, uh, an enemy you treat with after you've defeated them, but to make them come, look like common criminals in the eyes of the public. And President Milosevic was literally kidnapped by the British Air Force out of Serbia to take to The Hague when the Serbian Constitutional Court 
rejected the extradition request to said it's unconstitutional. The same day they put him in chains and, shang and really took him, <laughs> to use that word, took him to The Hague and there he died under their, in their hands. Yeah. yeah. Pierre, yours is next. And after that, I have Joe Kelly and then Zoe and then Alan Collins. <laughs> Pierre, you'll need to unmute yourself or Brendan will need to unmute you. I'm not sure which happens first. Okay, we still can't hear you. Pierre, we can't hear you. I don't know what's happening here. Your microphone may be faulty. Do you want to try and sort that out and I'll go to Joe Kelly while you're doing that? Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Um, Joe, you're next up. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I, I'm speaking on as an individual. Uh, I am a, an academic, a teacher student at Nebraska University, but I don't speak on behalf of my university. So I just want to say that. But I would share this kind of information with my peers who, who are organizing a sort of justice group. Uh, so that, that's where I am. Okay, so the question I have is, in terms of the American side, in terms of campaigning, uh, is there much contact with organizations like, let's say, the American Civil Liberties Union and, you know, Code Pink and stuff and building a, a, a campaign on that side of it? Because I'm I mean, I've noticed that Biden is pretty silent about this particular issue. Uh, it doesn't seem like he's about saying anything as uh, uh, belligerent as let's say Trump, Trump did. But, and he's in uh, with the uh, Afghan situation. He's a bit of he's in a bit of a corner as well. So he might listen to reason if the if there's more campaigning on that side. I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Joe. I mean, the question is directed to you, Chris. Do you want to go first? I don't think there's much, really, because most of the focus is on uh, in the Canadian scene. Uh, I'm a member of the National Lawyers Guild in the States, uh, left us uh, sort of progressive lawyers, so-called, and um, there's no action again about Meng Wanzhou. Uh, there are some articles about it, but there's no act, active <laughs> action. And I think they probably wait for her to be sent there. If, if she is, then something could be started. Um, but so, no, I, I don't see any, uh, any action and unless that happens. Yeah. John, have you anything to add to that? Well, um, but ironically, I'm on the Alex Saab campaign and, um, some of the material, which Ken Stone has been circulating, has been circulated with us and people are following the Meng Wanzhou campaign. Um, and it, it, there is this important overlap. I know that Alan talked about international campaign on, on this issue. I think it's important that we do this. Um, although here in Canada, we have a challenge to Canada and Canada has to change its policies. And I'm very, you know, I, people like Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War is concentrating primarily on Canada and secondarily on the international things, which I agree with. If I can just interject, Oops. yeah, yes, sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to add that. Um, uh, no, I forgot what I was going to add. I'm sorry. Uh, um, oh, it's about the, uh, the, the Biden. And um, I don't think Biden is pulling back from pressure on China. In fact, I think he's following Trump's uh, pressure on China and, and Obama, who followed on Obama, and they're increasing the pressure. I don't see the circumstance in Afghanistan affecting that. In fact, I think they withdrew partly so they can put more pressure on China and focus their resources that way. So I expect more pressure on China. And I do not think the American government is going to relinquish this case unless Canada and the Canadian courts rejects it and then causes them a, a, a further problems. Yeah. Uh, should we try Pierre again and see if it can work this time? Do you want to unmute, unmute him? Brendan, could you try and get Pierre unmuted? Uh, yes, uh, Pierre has been unmuted. Uh, he just needs to, on his end, uh, accept that, and uh, and then he'll be able to speak. So, Pierre, you still need to unmute yourself. And we still can't hear you. 
there's something something wrong with your microphone. I'm very sorry. Uh, I don't know. Do we have the chat operating, um, Brendan? If, if if Pierre wants to put his question in the chat, would I be able to read it there? Let me see if I can bring that up for for Pierre. So we'll work on that, Pierre. I'm very sorry about this. Next up is is Zoe. Um, so could you enable Zoe's uh, to unmute herself? Um, yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to join this conference. My name is Zoe. I'm an associate researcher at a think tank based in China. So um, we have been following the case for some time. Um, Justine Holmes herself has called the case unusual. And the defense has argued fairly powerfully and there's no deception, deprivation, or causation. So my question would be, um, what's your read on Justin Home questioning and on the defense's arguments on the lack of grounds for fraud during the committal hearings? Um, what do you think? That's, thank you. Chris, that's probably for you first and then John. I'm not sure I understood the question, but if she's asking, can we, uh... Um, make assumptions from comments by the judge about the case as to her ultimate decision. I'm also a bit op uh, slightly optimistic like John is because of recent comments she's made about wondering where exactly the fraud is. That's, that's uh, quite significant. But often, you know, in trial lawyers, we face judges who will ask pertinent questions like that in order to look like they're fair when they make a bad decision for the, against the defense. So it's difficult to say, but we can be cautiously optimistic that she is seeing the light and maybe realizing that that's the way it should go. John, any comments on that? Well, the the um, the issue of I mean, this, you can't predict what a judge is going to do, um, but the judge seems to understand, as Chris pointed out. I think um, there there is very little. Well, there's no loss, and under fraud law. The, the risk of loss must be real and not imaginary or just possible. The court noted there's been no harm and the management knows all about it. The fraud must be clearly identified and among um, ones nothing to do with the money going through the US banks. She sent her money to Britain, not her money. Huawei sent their money for this contract. To so there's no relationship with the US. So um, there's so many things, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit off topic, but when they arrested her, they stopped her with the border, border people because she has no right to a lawyer. And they got her passwords for her, 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 her phone and her computer. And then they, it was for the for the um, FBI. That was clearly in evidence. That's abusive. That's just insulting to a senior executive of an important country who is not, ironically, white or not uh, Canadian. And so, the whole process is is a shocking process, and people should have to understand that they can't do that to anybody for. Ill, illegal or lying or dishonest grounds. They can't check my computer if it's the purpose is not to check my computer, whether I have pornography in my computer, but whether they want to give my computer to another country. So these are so many things which color this case, which are shocking and no one should be treated that way. So I'm going to take Alan Collins next and then John and Toronto TV also has a question. So those three may take up much of our time. And I just want to double check with Brendan. We do have a question from a Chinese blogger that is going to be a video. So I'd suggest we might take that after Alan, if that's okay with Brendan. But yes. Alan, over to you. Can I, can I speak? Yes, yes, you can. Okay, I didn't know whether I was on or not. Um, I'm, my name is Alan Collins. I'm a filmmaker from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I just made a film about Halifax's response to the climate emergency, which is being shown in the Canada-China Film Festival in October. I'm very proud of that. And um, 
I've just been listening to everybody talking and it, the whole situation seems to prove to me that our courts are just as corrupt as the Chinese courts. They're no better, they're actually probably worse. And one of the main reasons is the judge re refuses to make any decision on the, on the case and she's not even going to say anything for another two months. Meanwhile, these two uh, Canadians in China are being held prisoner on account of her callous actions. So how can she defend herself for that behavior? Why can't and there be a prisoner exchange? Why can't there be immediately a prisoner exchange between our two countries? Prisoner exchanges are not uncommon. They happen during the Vietnamese war. They're happening all the time in different, different uh, wars. And there is a Cold War going on right now between Canada and China. We should have a prisoner exchange too. I think yeah. what I would like to ask is if everybody that's listening to this conference could write a letter to their local newspaper, uh, Globe and Mail or Toronto Star, whatever that is, and complain about the injustice of the Canadian courts and why they're not doing anything to get the two Michaels free. Because they could be doing, they could, they could uh, <coughs> accomplish that tomorrow if they wanted. They're doing nothing. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much. A little sideswipe at the Chinese courts there, but I'm going to hand this to Chris first and then John. Yes, I, I have no, I have no information. The, the corruption in the Chinese courts uh, remains to be proven by someone. Um, and 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 also, we do not know that the courts here are corrupt. We haven't had Justice Holmes' decisions or the reasons she's going to make them. We can, you can make that allegation if she comes down with a bad decision. And, and her reasons are uh, unfound, or there's no foundation for her, her logic. Um, nevertheless, the, uh, I don't think we're, I don't see Canada in a cold war with, with China. I'm not at war with China. I don't know why the government of this country has chosen to act in this hostile fashion against its second largest trading partner who's done no harm to Canada and has done great benefit. And Canadians have done great benefit to China. I have no idea why uh, this idea that we have a, some sort of war, hot or cold against China has come up, except that the, the government is following American orders and dictates. So um, the two Michaels, well, China is stating that there's no relationship between the two cases. So if um, they want that dealt with separately from Meng Wanzhou, Meng Wanzhou was arrested first, Meng Wanzhou was the, is the, the, what led to all the situation. It's Canada's injustice that needs to be addressed. And Canada can then work with China about getting back their two citizens arrested over there for espionage, uh, as they some have often done in the past. But if they send Meng Wanzhou to the United States, they're going to lose that bargaining chip. And uh, I do not think it'd be, it'd be much more difficult to get those two fellows back here. I would add to that, though, that if we embark on the practice of exchanging innocent people for guilty people, yes. then uh, you're into the legitimizing political hostage taking, which is not a good place to go. But anyway, exactly. John, that's a very good point. Exactly. John, do you want to add something to that? Yeah. Very briefly, um, I have no idea whether I don't see any evidence of the Chinese courts being corrupt. The fact that it was carried out in secret is normal. Because in Canada, if you had security uh, trials or immigration certificates, it's always in, in secret, always in camera. And that's the nature of, of national security issues. Um, of course, they can make an exchange. Um, I'm not in a position to criticize Judge Holmes. I, one judgment I didn't really, were, of the judgments I know, the one about the equivalent criminality, I tend to disagree with her, but she's been kind of even handed on many issues. Um, obviously we're not in court, so we can't be sure, that, you know, we don't know exactly what happened all the time, but she can't make a judgment. And um, I'm of the age that I could be a judge, although I would never be a judge. And to handle a case like this, to write a judgment after all those days of hearings by sophisticated counsel who have done on the defense side an honest and rigorous job, it will be a, a judgment of 500 pages. Like a, and, and it's a massive job and she has to do it right because she has to apply the law. Uh, as much as I am not that 
a great fan of the Canadian justice system. Um, there is a, a, a fairness which has surrounded a, a good part of these proceedings. I don't agree with her, you know, anyway, her, her bail conditions are not good enough, but that's another, you know, anyway, so that's it. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, just a quick question for Brendan to think about. Um, although we said we were going to end at 12, we have questions which may push us over that limit. And if the organizers could accept perhaps a 15 minute extension, I think that would be valuable. But uh, Alan, I'm, I'm told that would be acceptable. Okay, so we do have time, I think, to take all the questions. On that basis, I will take next the question which Toronto TV has placed in the chat, which I assume I should just read out. Um, maybe, maybe you can see it. I asked former Canadian ambassador to China, John McCallum, about the possible solution in a Chinese media conference. John suggested three options and later got fired. While we are waiting for the judge's decision, no matter what Canada may have to do damage control, no, no matter what, Canada may have to do damage control with China or US. Is there a remedial solution is the question. I'm not sure who to take first, perhaps John. Well, I think um, remedial solution is the correct solution. And what's the most striking issue to me is the fact that the information from the Hong Kong court, which revealed that the fraud application is wrong, there was no fraud. And this material, I'll remind you, was not admitted in the trial because at a extradition trial, you don't bring all your defenses. It's like if Ken Stone was charged with murder in Florida and he, he had an iron tight alibi in London he still could be extradited to the US unless the Canadian government looked at all the evidence and said, no way. So that's the solution. Stop it under section 23, paragraph C. Yeah. Chris, any thoughts? No, I don't have much to add to that. I, uh, it's clear that um, if she is um, to be ordered sent back, then the defense can appeal, that will take some time. And, and, and in fact, the Minister of Justice can still step in at any time and uh, rescind the, <clears throat> send the request back to the United States. So th there is no remedial, to use that word, or other solution except for freedom. That's the only solution. And the other danger, of course, is that the appeal process, if it goes ahead, would take a long time. Yeah. So that in fact you have a, an indefinite detention, you have a kind of almost a Julian Assange situation where the effect of these extra legal measures, extra territorial measures, <laughs> even though the person is found not guilty, is to make a, a great dent in somebody's life. And I think that's uh, one of the extra other reasons that, you know, on the sheer, sheer grounds of humanity and miscarriage of justice for the justice manager to step in and end the proceedings. I'm going to take Jan now. And then I would suggest after that, that we think of playing the, the, the video, if that's all right with Brendan. So Jan, um, you could uh, enable unmuting now, Brendan. Okay. Fire away, you're, you're free to go. John? Yeah, yes, it's me. Okay, um, can yes, you yes, hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you to take my question. And uh, I'm from China Central Television. Uh, from the beginning, I started to uh, follow the case uh, till now, so, uh, I know that uh, to be a journalist, I know that I should I should respect uh, any verdict by the judge. So I don't want to uh, expect any uh, 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 previous uh, judgment uh, before the uh, the verdict released. Uh, my question is about the my uh, impression during the uh my reporting of the case the first is that uh irresponsibility by the media i mean uh, some canadian media uh, report a case always linked 
won't taste these uh, two Michaels or uh, the uh, Schellenberg. Uh, but to be a Ch Chinese journalist, I know that uh, the two cases are different. Meng is because uh, Meng is arrested just because the uh, Americans, uh, uh, American claimed Meng uh, is guilty on fraud, but we know that the two Michaels is, uh, is sealed by the Chinese, uh, by, Ch by Chinese uh, government because they are espionage behavior. Uh, so my, my impression that is that uh, the Canadian government uh, uh, criticized the Chinese government uh, on Schellenberg's uh, case, because Schellenberg, we know that he's a drug smuggler. He was, uh, uh, you know, in China, it's a, it's, a pet, it's a death penalty. But in Canada, no, no death, uh, no death penalty. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a problem for me why we should respect Canadian law, but Canadian government never respect the Chinese law. It's my first question. Um, and another question is that, <clears throat> sorry, another question is that is a media responsibility. And the, uh, I have a uh, experience during my reporting the, this case. Uh, I think maybe some of, uh, some of you have read some articles from the Global and Mail. This media criticized me, criticized CCTV, uh, about uh, uh, some fake protest in front of the uh, court entrance, but I have I have to say that it, I have I have no any idea about the protest, and the, the Global Mail attacked me that they contacted me and uh, no response, but the truth is that they never attacked me, they never contacted me, they never get any. Uh, information to me. So I think the, you know, the Western media or some Can uh, Canadian media uh, has very high reputation in the past. But now I have to say many Chinese, including me, think that their reputation uh, is in doubt. So can, can you tell me why the, these things changed? Yes. I hope that that question is clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you very much for that indeed and for the information as well. I'll, I'll start, uh, I think, with John and then with Chris, if that's okay with you guys at that order. Yeah. Okay, John. I'll be very brief. Um, it's called exceptionalism. And it's, I don't like crying racist, but it is kind of a racist supre supremacist attitude by the Canadian system, which is her inherited largely from the British tradition. And there's a question of supremacy of the Canadian legal system and the Chinese are backward, which they aren't by the way, of course, of course they aren't. And the Chinese legal system uh, has in-camera hearings, which we do too. So there's a question of that supremacy, which runs right through the fiber of Canadians, and uh, it has to be struggled. We have to struggle against this exceptionalism. And to a certain extent, the same comment applies to the media, where the media, instead of doing in-depth studies and publishing the truth, the directors of the media, as I understand it, um, want to reflect Canadian foreign policy, and they they get their news from other news releases and not from the first primary sources. Now, your question is like a university course in media, which 
it's a big, you know, something would be 45 hour course studying the media. So I, I can't answer that completely, but this is what we're up against. And uh, that's why it's important for the, the world to stand up to Western media and tell the truth and defend their, their countries, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Chris, over to you. I agree with what John said. And <clears throat> this, the question highlights the fact that the Meng Wanzhou case is also part of the propaganda campaign against China. That's another reason she's been held hostage and to attack Huawei, to discredit Huawei as a criminal organization, to, to, to portray China as a criminal nation, as they did with every other targeted nation they've ever attacked eventually. And the media in this country and in the West generally, whenever they, the, uh, the foreign policy requires it, jump to the tune of the government and all of them, all at the same time, know which organization they pretend to be separate and unique, and yet they all come up with the same stories on the same day, in the same words, in the same phrases, in the same attitude, which looks like it's all directed from some central point, which somebody has to explain to me at some point in the future, how that's physically done. Common press releases as one, but I think there's more going on. But anyway, it's, uh, it's true that the, the Western press generally is more engaged in these matters in propaganda than in journalism. And yeah. the hypocrisy runs rampant in this country. Yeah. I'm going to next, uh, we have time for a, a video and also Janine has patiently been waiting for a second question. Now I'm definitely going to take you, don't worry. Um, and we'll have a go at seeing if Pierre can intervene. I just want to say something about the last point which is the economic motive for what's going on, because uh, there has been a long decline in the growth of all the nations of the global north, without exception, Canada, America, and so on. Growth is now somewhere around between naught and 1%. The way that the United States of America and its uh, allies is a bad word, but its followers have been trying to resolve this, is to stop anybody else from catching up is to slow everybody else down. And they are therefore particularly alarmed by China's growth because China is not accepting the Washington consensus line, which has been disaster for most countries of the global south and is responsible for massive poverty and inequality worldwide. Now, the problem is this, that actually we should welcome the growth of China. It means that Canadians will get better products. They'll get them for less money. They'll have greater opportunities for enjoyment and, and mutual exchange. But instead, what's being done is actually a very selfish reaction, in my opinion, which is to attempt to shore up the profits of a quite small layer of Canadian society who fear competition from Chinese companies that are actually more efficient. And it's very interesting because the whole doctrine that accompanies this says the competition is good, the market is great, we should welcome competition, we'll, we'll flush out the inefficient producers. But here, these inefficient producers are the tail wagging the dog and saying that actually, no, we've got to use unfair practices, which is what this is, to stop the threat from China, which is actually a great promise for most ordinary Canadians. So I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time, but as well as an economist, that, that point needs to be made. So now we'll take the video, if Brendan's ready, and now I'll take Johnny. Hi, my name is Fernando Munoz, and I am asking a question from Dongguan in Guangdong, China. Uh, first of all, I would like to wish Ms. Meng a very speedy trial, and hopefully she can come back to China as soon as possible. The question has to do with uh, Mr. Uh, Freighter's allegation that HSBC suffered risk of loss and risk of penalties and risk of reputational damage. How does the court assess the, the risk, the existence of risk or the non-existence of risk or the level of risk. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's, that's great. A very clear question. Uh, let's take John first and then Chris. Well, jokingly, how does the court assess this? Well, I'm not in Judge Holmes' mind, but she has to apply the law and the risk of loss must not be imaginary. It must be real. And the court has noted there's no harm and that management um, had all the facts. 
um, the loss must be clearly identified and it has not been identified after six or seven years, no civil proceedings, no sanctions against HSBC for this. So um, from this point of view, we should be optimistic. And I'm, being, I'm saying that in a measured way because we can't say it, it's all, we've got it, she's gonna win. But there's room, there's wiggle room in our favor, in the favor of Ming Wenzhou on this issue. Chris, your comments? Well, that, that's what John said is correct. And um, the, we can go a bit further by saying that the, the risk the, lo the risk of loss or the loss is entirely theoretical. It's the, the American claim is based on their allegation that because HSBC violated its illegal sanctions against Iran, that HSBC could face penalties in US courts. Well, HSBC, if it wanted to defend itself in the US courts instead of paying some fine to get the easy way out, could actually say that the laws the Americans are applying, A, do not apply to them. They're not American citizens. They don't, they actually, the matter didn't take place in the US. And further, that the, the laws they're applying, which they, against them, the sanctions on Iran, are illegal under American law because the, the American law includes the Charter of the United Nations, which prohibits any single country from inflicting such sanctions on another country. So they could successfully argue in American court that there is no penalty, no loss to them because they're not, they're not obliged to pay any penalty. So the, the loss is entirely theoretical. And in fact, I don't think it's even, I think, I think there is no, there's no possible loss in law. So yeah. that's, that's how they would assess it. So um, Janine's coming next. I don't know if Brendan has any uh, or can have any closing remarks, but if so, I'll give you the opportunity to make them. But uh, Janine, last but not least. Thanks. Uh, and again, Janine Solanke from Fire This Time newspaper, and I think a good question to end off on. Um, going forward from today's press conference organized by the Canada-wide campaign to free Meng Wanzhou, uh, can the representatives tell us a bit more about the plan uh, that the campaign has in the coming months? Thank you. Well, that may be the opportunity to bring in um, uh, Brendan or Ken first. I don't know what you think of that, Brendan. That sounds like a good idea. One of us could do that. Let me uh, let me just check. Um, meanwhile, um, maybe Chris, uh, Chris or John would like to say a few words about where they think things might go from here. Well, I'm not, um, I, I like very much the campaign that the coalition has put together and other, other groups. Um, uh, where it's going from here, I do not know. I, I'm not really um, in the planning stages of all these campaigns. So I believe that to you and uh, Ken Stone and Brendan. Is Brendan ready to say something yet? Uh, Ken's here. Ken, okay. Do you want to say, give us a few words? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan, for uh, the opportunity. Um, the the Cross Canada campaign to free Meng Wanzhou will be trying to insert the issue of Meng Wanzhou into the federal election that's taking place right now. Uh, today, <laughs> today is the first day of our uh, social media barrage, and we're asking people uh, to send out tweets and to po make posts on Facebook. Uh, concerning this press conference uh, when the when the recording is up to share that around and for the next four Thursdays uh, we will have we will continue this social media barrage it will be leading up to a webinar uh, at about the time of the federal election uh, the voting uh, around September the 20th when we will attempt to show to the Canadian people uh, the uh, un injustice of the uh, case against Meng Wanzhou. Uh, we were pl we're planning to put uh, create uh, election signs, uh, election stickers, and we have an election leaflet. So if there's anyone out there who'd like to help participate in the campaign and go to an all candidates meeting or an appearance of one of the five party leaders, parliamentary party leaders, and hand out flyers or hold a sign please contact the Hamilton Coalition to stop the war or me, and we will arm you with the proper ammunition to uh, argue the, the, for the release of Meng Wanzhou. 
So that's our, our near future plans, Alan. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, John, do you want to add anything to that in terms of suggestions or advice? Well, um, to get, a, because um, discussing legal issues in, a, in this forum, it's quite difficult. And I know that Cyrus Jansen's uh, YouTube um, interviews on the Meng Wanzhou case are very instructive, they're very correct. And for those who wish to pursue the issues to understand them, they are good sources of information, as are some of the Daniel Dumbrell material, although less so on the Meng Wanzhou issues. Um, it's very important to understand because we all have brains and the Canada thinks that and the media think we don't have brains, but we all do and we're all capable. Well, speaking of brains, I think there's one absence from this meeting, which I'm rather regretting, which is John Iverson of the National Post, because after the first meeting of this body, um, he wrote an article in the, in the National Post in which he called everybody useful idiots. Well, idiots can be useful to many people. <laughs> and I think that it might be an idea for people to write letters to the uh, National Post, simply saying, are you going to retract this idiotic assertion of your journalist? Because the journalistic coverage of this trial has also been sadly lacking. And uh, CBC has a responsibility. Globe and Mail has a responsibility. There are other newspapers which have a responsibility. And I think that uh, it's important we don't let them off the hook uh, because they're um, always at the forefront when it comes to supporting hypocrisy, which uh, is not a Canadian virtue or should not be. It's a Canadian practice. It shouldn't be a Canadian virtual value. Uh, the bloggers, I think, are very important. And Jonathan has Jonathan Dye has been doing uh, excellent work there with uh, the bloggers that were mentioned. There's also Lee Barrett, who does some very useful videos uh, on, on, on the, the case. So I think that another thing we can all do is, is promote and link up with the uh, vloggers, as they're called, the video loggers. I feel it's time to close this meeting unless anybody jerks their hand in the air or unless Brendan or Ken stop me. So I'd like to thank you all for a wonderful meeting. I've certainly enjoyed it thoroughly. I think it's been very instructive. Thanks especially to uh, the organizers, uh, Hamilton Coalition, and to John and, and, and Chris for their very clear explanations, and to all of you for your polite and uh, patient participation. And we look forward to being able to celebrate the release uh, of Meng Wanzhou in the near future, thanks to your efforts.